Thank you so much for that 10 Black Line Supreme. Aryan, thank you. Even your friend Tovia Singer admits that Daniel 1 through 6 were written by the Great Assembly. The G Great Assembly apparently also wrote on behalf of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, yeah, and I am. Look, I'm, I'm friends <laughs> I, with I don't know where any of this is coming from, but uh, uh, this always mystifies He's me. Orthodox like, Jew, by the way. Yeah, uh, like there's no evidence for this. This is just a story someone is telling. Uh, there's no evidence for this at all. Uh, so um, that's an example of a just so story. Like people just start telling stories about how these books got written or whatever. But when you go look at the time, the actual centuries when these things were going on, like, these stories don't exist. Like they're, so this is, there's no evidence for this. Um, so yeah, we, we can't really, we can't really buy that. Thank you, Dr. Carrier. Thank you, Arian. Thank you so much. I hope I'm like pronouncing your name with that J there. I'm not trying to say Arjun anymore. David Stevens says, Carrier is Jesus made flesh. You rock, Carrier. <laughs> All right, that's an exaggeration. Uh, let's, let's not get let's not get too crazy here. <clears throat> yeah, well, I appreciate. Thank you so much for the super chat, David. Throwing a whole fifty at me. Nice, appreciate, it, man. Do I need to take a, a clothing article off? I mean, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Look, my friend, I read between the lines. Is his name? He actually wrote me. He's like, Derek. It's it's literally read and between lines and i was like, awesome. <laughs> so thank you for the ten, man. Good nice. luck. I appreciate nice. it. Always uh, looking out for you, for your friend here, man. Thank you. If Christianity was a mystery, Cole. Okay, here we go. Do, we're getting off. We're getting off track here. So I'm gonna <laughs> screenshot. I'm gonna screenshot this Indo, and we're gonna deal with this in just a moment when we finish up with Daniel. If that's okay, I just have a few more things I want to touch on. If that's okay, um, Daniel's use in Christianity. Yeah. Like, how do they calculate? Because you're the math guy. You're the Bayesian theory guy. You're the big like. I can't even keep up with you on this Bayesian uh, methodology of like prior probabilities and stuff. Um, one day maybe, but I just don't have that mathematics skill. The furthest I went is calculus in high school. And that was before I did many drugs in between then and now. And so I just have lost memory if it comes to that idea. So <laughs> And calculus is a completely different. I'm completely just different saying. mathematical field. So that's literally, theory. yeah. So, but anyway, uh, proceed. You're, you're getting to Daniel. What? Yeah. What, the what math, the math, like how did Christians, what did they do? Where did they, how did they calculate this and say, look, we got to make sure this lands on Jesus in the thirties. And somehow it relates to the temple's destruction, especially when you look at Mark and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can easily find this online. There's a million internet pages where Christians are showing you this. Um, but it, it, what they do is that, so the original authors in Daniel, they, they separate out a 49-year period and a 434-year period. Um, so what Christians do is they don't separate them out. They take it as one continuous period of those uh, sequentially. So that's one whole period of those together. Uh, and then they, then they start looking for how to interpret, because it, it says the clock starts from the time the word went out. And so they can reinterpret, they can choose which word went out, right? Like which which thing are we talking about here? Now the authors meant when Jeremiah published his prophecy. That, that, that's clear from the context and the original intent of it. Um, but if you can change that and say, well, it was like the, when the decree that Cyrus gave that freed the Jews, or you could pick a variety of different starting points right. and then pick a, and then choose your calendar because there's different there's lunar calendar there's solar calendar there are different lunar calendars and so what constitutes a year you can dicker around with and so you can convert one lunar calendar into a solar calendar and thus gets a few more years out of it so you can you can really play around with how the math works out and get a date uh, and the date can be it, can, it lands in various places there's a lot the christians who make these arguments often make mistakes in the arguments, um, but uh, you know, like mistakenly start wrong starting point or wrong year or adding the math wrong or whatever. Um, so that it get, you get a bunch of different results depending on what you plug in. Um, but the results when you do this particular Christian approach uh, come between like 28 and 38 AD, I think somewhere in, like it falls in that that area. And you know, some claim they can get exactly the 30 or exactly the 33 or something like that. I, I, that might be a little dodgy, but. Um, that's what they do. And so I, I did talk about this ages ago. It's on uh, Secular Web, one of my articles on, uh, oh, Newman on Prophecy. So my article on Newman on Prophecy 
which talks about the methodology of evaluating prophecy. So people who want methods on this will, will find that useful, it's, even though it's, I wrote it ages and ages ago. Uh, it, has some, it has a section on the 77s pro, prophecy and with footnotes that talk about how the math works and different ways to do the math. Uh, so we really, really want to like dig into that. And I, that's not even complete. Like there are more ways to like arrange the math than, than the ones I even talk about. Um, but uh, but the, the ones I talk about are the more popular ones. Like Julius Africanus is like the first, the third century Christian apologist who who really is the first one to publish a version of this math, uh, right? So um, so that, that's like the earliest version of it. Uh, but you can, you can see my article on Newman on Prophecy covers some of the angles on that. It's interesting because like modern ideas, if you will, we saw Harold camping. How did he know or what was he doing in his head to make him think that day? Like, <laughs> you know, you know I, I didn't I never looked into that because I didn't care. <laughs> it, it would just be interesting um, in light of what you're right. saying. And in 1840 something, the Millerite movement, I can't remember exactly, but they thought 4000 years or some calculation directly from a day for whatever yeah. reason, this was right. going to be the day. You know, yeah, yeah, what, what yeah, made yeah. them think that? I, I mean, yeah, you could go into it and find a, a convoluted logic of some kind uh, and, and how they keep changing it. Yeah, these things just interest me. So I, I never really yeah. look into those details. Uh, there are a couple books, by the way, on apocalypticism. Um, I can't remember their titles right now. I, I do reference them. I reference them in my Wichita talk, I think. Uh, but uh, so, so people want to look at there, there are two good books that cover the whole history of predicting the end of the world. Uh, and so if you wanna like get a dive in on all the different ways that was done and why and so on, uh, one or both of those books would be the way to go. I, I Unfortunately, off the top of my head, I can't remember their names, but- You're not um, omniscient? <laughs> nor infallible, yes, yeah. My, <laughs> my memory is, it has limitations. Well, Sean, thanks a lot, man. I'll keep my shirt on just for you guys. I appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> thanks for the super chat. <laughs> Uh, look, crossover maniac. Thank you for the super chat. Is there some parallels mm -hmm. in the creation of the gospel of Mark and the book of Daniel? Do you see similarity in how they were created? Um, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, literarily, I, perhaps I was going to say, can I add something to that? Like, yeah, you know how the temple is destroyed and we see what we would call ex eventu. Like, it seems like it knows something already, even though it's putting it into the thirties, we know it was written after the temple's war, right. uh, the, the, this destruction. However, there are like this anticipation of the parousia and stuff that's supposed to come too. So some of that's this didn't point. happen and some of it did. Yeah, that's a good point. That is one similarity is that Mark is pretending, well, he doesn't really say when he's written. He's not pretending to be a particular person. He's not, so, so Mark is not a forgery per se, because when it was originally published, it was attributed to nobody. Uh, and and it nowhere in there says that they were a witness or they talked to a witness or anything. They, it's just they just tell a story. They're like a, a bard with a leer and they're just or a bard with a liar. They're just they're just telling their story. Um, th that's how Mark is written. Mark is written very much in the classic model of, of myth at the time, the way the way right. uh, the way you would just tell stories, the way storytellers would just tell stories not the way it's not written the way histories were written back then um so uh so it's very much in that vein uh and it's much more in the the mythic biography genre so it's it's different from daniel um mark has a lot of different literary models so like mark is using the what we call the pericope model but that's a word that uh in that's from biblical studies in uh when they weren't talking to classicists classicists had a, their own word for it which comes from the ancient rhetorical manuals which is it's called crayi which is these these are the same things where you tell a little unit of a story and then you stack these units together to tell a bigger story and then even the arrangement of the units tells a story un, un, unto itself so you have sandwiches and circular uh, ring structure and so on um mark is definitely using greek rhetorical techniques uh, in, in a way that the authors of right. daniel did not um, so, uh, so, so there's, I see more differences and similarities, but you, you can point to similarities. Obviously Mark is aware of Daniel. So, so Mark is like riffing on Daniel in some ways. Uh, so there's a lot of different threads you could pick at in terms of what their connections are. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that they're like strongly paralleled, uh, in literally. Revelation in is, and, and the King below says, you're the goat. No question. <laughs> Just letting you know. And I, you know what that means, I'm sure, by now, right? No, I don't know what that means. I'm you out do of the not way. know? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That means you live on a farm. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, you're, you're the man. Let's put it that way, bro. You're okay. The, right. You're, you're yeah. a beast. You're a beast. Okay? They don't want none. none of, nobody wants none of that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> now, the book of Revelation, I think we, we need to 
Um, couple more points, and then I'd like to get into these other super chats and any other questions. I don't give a crap mm -hmm. what the question is. If you want to super chat it, you can. We got a couple on the side just because our time's running out, and you and me, like, time goes by so quick. So, yeah, I know, right? The, the book of Revelation, <laughs> we had a good question earlier, and it, it was just in passing, but it was irrelevant to the topic at that very moment when I didn't want to interrupt you. What is the political agenda of Revelation? It's using Daniel for sure. But what would you say is the political uh, motivation to it since Daniel's a political motivation and it's it's apocalyptic? Yeah, it's um, right. So Revelation wasn't written to promote a war, for example. So it's definitely a different context. Um, the best book on this was Elaine Pagel's recent book, uh, Revelations, uh, which is about the book of Revelation. Um, where she goes into like what is the social agenda of the author, and um, and I think it, broad strokes here, uh, it, it is a critique of Roman imperial power. So a lot of what's going on in there is basically uh, explaining uh, what Rome is doing is immoral and, and bad, and so on, uh, and then predicting why this why God is going to take it all out, uh, and it is predicting uh, various other things that it, it wants to sort of like. It's, it's one of those examples of getting people excited by the evangelism, getting excited to join the church and be saved because time is running out. So, so its political agenda is to bring in the flock. Now, the, the controversial part of this is that uh, I think, and I think more scholars now agree, the author of Revelation is a member of the Torah observance sect of Christianity. So this is actually an anti-Gentile Christian uh, thing. So it's actually saying only Jews are going to be saved. Uh, is revelation is like it, it, it the idea is like only the only observant jews who are christians are going to get salvation it doesn't explicitly say that it doesn't just outright say that uh but it, it tells a sort of political narrative of how that's how they think it's going to go uh and and try to get people into the church into specifically the torah observant church and that's in other words to convert to judaism and uh and and then become a practicing christian within the jewish tradition uh so that, that's so it, it's it's if in so far in so far it's political it's a critique of the secular political situation and a defense and advertisement for the sub-politics of the church. Uh, so that it's actually a political infighting between the different factions of the church. Uh, so it represents a particular faction in that battle of uh, trying to control the narrative. And uh, that's, and that, that's why it's very similar. Thing. Right, and that's very similar to, to Matthew, right? So uh, Revelation and Matthew really, they come from the same sectarian angle. Uh, and so there's a lot of overlap between those texts and vocabulary and concepts and stuff like that. So they, they really represent the same point of view. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Carrier. That's one of the things I noticed in like the angel that comes to one of the churches in chapter two. He's talking about, oh, you did some things right, but we're going to correct this issue. If you're, you're practicing this, this, that you're eating meat, sacrificed to idols, stuff like that. And it's like, Paul taught that. Hmm. I wonder if they're jabbing at a Pauline Christianity. Hmm, anyway. Um, so, Mark, uh, thank you for the super chat. How do you interpret Psalms 82.6? I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. Dr. Carrier? Oh, it's been ages since I've looked at that verse, so I, I don't really have an opinion on it right now. <laughs> oh. I, have to, I have to go back and look at uh, what, I've, what, I've, what my notes have said on, on studying that. So okay. um, I can't help you there right now. Okay, and you don't want to get – I get it. I don't blame you. Um, goat means uh, greatest of all time, by the way. And uh, making sure oh. you saw that. <laughs> I yeah. did not get, boy, I am. Yeah, I'm definitely a, a noob when it comes to pop culture. Okay. What do we Indo, got? Next? Thank you again for the 616. I think we already addressed this somewhat, but I said most common objection I get to forgeries. You already addressed this one. I just yeah, took yeah. a screenshot. Okay, cool. So then we're caught yeah. up on that. Okay, cool. Then we're going to, then we're going to read between the lines here with my friend, Richard, do you think there's a realistic chance that a sitting professor will employ on the historicity of Jesus as a text for an upper level class or senior seminar. Yeah, there's a chance someday. Uh, I, I don't know when, like probably not soon. Uh, but you know, like uh, in, in, you know, let's say 10 years from now, uh, if someone wants to teach a seminar on the historicity of Jesus, it's going to have to be OHJ and Latastri's book. Right. Uh, unless someone writes something else in between, between now and then the, the, those are the only peer reviewed books that are the latest. And if they have then throw in the last, the other one, the next most recent one, which is uh, Shirley Jackson cases, pro historicity book, it's going to suffer by comparison. So I, I, I'm really hoping someone will produce a good historicity defense book. Uh, that would be, why don't part you of write one? Person. Why don't you play devil's oh, advocate? No, no, and I, actually no, I, can't. I, I really, I really couldn't do that. I, I think it should be someone who actually believes in the conclusion 
um, okay. or, or is taking it seriously so that um, they, first of all, they have credibility. Uh, you know, if I write the best, if I write a pro-historicity book, everybody will, you know, dismiss it as uh, tanking the case, right? Um, whereas uh, if someone who who's actually like on the fence or uh, actually is pro-historicity, if they write it, that they'll have, coming from that, they'll have more credibility. And it also means that they will have the higher motive to like look for maybe arguments that I've overlooked, for example. Um, and so, so I wanna see someone who's either fence sitting or pro-historicity do it. Uh, and someone who has a PhD in a relevant field and, and who does gets it through peer review and does it all correctly. Um, uh, I, 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 ha I have like my, my dream list of who I'd want to write these things, but, um, but I, it doesn't matter. Like I, it doesn't have to be someone of particular prominence. It's just anybody who's qualified uh, and, and, and through any publisher that is a legitimate academic press, like, like I want to see this happen. Thank you, Dr. Carrier. My friend, Dennis R. Lecker. Thank you for the super chat, Dennis. Appreciate it, bro. Love you, man. How might one respond to Bart Ehrman? And I do like him appeal or Bart Ehrman's appeal to academic consensus when he argues that no person of cons consequence uh, would tolerate address answer the idea that Jesus did not exist. Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, it's a bad argument. Um, but so, so that's this is an example of of Ehrman relying on fallacious reasoning rather than sound historical argument. Um, so it's a bad argument to begin with, uh, and that's even if it were true, uh, it's factually false. <laughs> There's, uh, so I list actually uh, a dozen uh, significant qualified uh, historians who either agree with mythicism or uh, who admit that it is plausible and worth considering, uh, uh, you know, who, who either agree or are agnostic or who admit that it's plausible and worth considering. Um, and, and I had linked, so that's in my Airman recap article. I have, I think it's item 22. Uh, I have the whole list of these people with links uh, to their credentials and links to uh, their affirmation of, of taking it seriously. So, so his idea that no one would take it seriously, no one you know, of consequence would take it seriously is false. So the premise is false. But even if the premise were true, the, the argument is fallacious. Uh, this is not how consensus arguments should work. If, if someone publishes a peer reviewed challenge to the consensus, it is a circular argument to cite the consensus against it. Right, like the, the whole point of getting a challenge of the consensus through peer review is that now we need to review this argument. So you, you actually have to address the arguments as to why the consensus is wrong. You can't just keep citing the consensus. Like that, that, that is not a valid or legitimate methodology and actually refutes and repudiates the entire point of consensus, right? The consensus is of no value if all it means is dogma, if it's just something we just, well, wh whatever the opinion is, we'll just cite it. It's not based on anything. It's not based on evidence. It's not based on argumentation. It can never be questioned. Uh, that's dogma, not consensus, right? So the only reason consensus is worth citing is that we're believe we're trusting that the scholars who are having this opinion have actually examined the arguments pro and con and have come to a conclusion that's informed uh, and, and based on their professional understanding of the field. So the consensus is useless. It, it has no value if that's not happening. So when there's a challenge to a consensus, it does have to be addressed. Uh, and, and I do mean like a proper peer review challenge, not just some wacko on the internet uh, coming up with stuff. A reference to the <laughs> beginning of the show. There, there are a lot of amateur, terrible arguments for mythicism uh, that, that are incompetent or badly argued and so on. Uh, and so I, I, it's very important to say, like, I don't think historians are obligated to address those. Uh, uh, but a peer, proper peer reviewed study that's within the field uh, methods and principles. Yeah, you need to you need to actually address the arguments. You can't just keep citing the cons consensus again. Uh, and so th so that's that's a fallacious argument, even if the premise were true and the premise isn't even true. So uh, and, and, you know, so we'll see. We'll also see where things are 10, 20 years from now as well. Well, since we've ran out of Super Chats, I have a little surprise for everybody watching. This is on Patreon, so if anyone has not joined it, you haven't seen this clip. It, you've probably seen it if you saw my Bart Ehrman interview, but I figure why not let you hear the horse's mouth say what yeah. he says when I ask him this and have you address it real quick. Yeah. Um, if you have any Super Chats, feel free to, but we're going we're gonna to go ahead and play this here and hope you could see this. Let me know if you can. So far. So that's really me, by the way, who beats Leviathan <laughs> in case anyone's wondering. Oh, is that so, what that is? Okay, yeah, excellent. 100%. So here we go. <laughs> Can you hear it? <laughs> yes. Hundreds of videos not released, early access, join the Patreon. 
myth vision. Shameless. Another donor says, I have a special request. Dr. Airman, please blink twice twice if you're simply a mythicist. <laughs> Uh, Would you like to comment? I'm gonna, get, some, up even more. I'm gonna get some toothpicks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the mythicists are completely wrong. And they, you know, and I think they're shooting themselves in the foot. Does everybody know what a mythicist is on your program? Yeah, everyone, yeah, pretty much. So um look, you're just doing yourself a disservice because people who are not mythicists are laughing at you. You're you're ignoring historical evidence in order to assert a point. And you might think it's great, but it's like, you know, look, if you're a big fan of Fox News or of MSNBC, you think it's great. But anybody who's not, who listens to this, says this is just crazy. And to, look, I'm, I'm a fan of MSNBC, I'm, but, you know, I, I, I'm a liberal. But, but, you know, the evidence is so overwhelming that I'm just like, why, why, why not argue something that is going to make a difference instead of like trying – so I know why people do it. They like to get a name from themselves or they like to get a book published or they like having a following. And then it's cool to say Jesus never existed, but it's just bollocks to put my English wife. <laughs> could, could we, and by, any, by any chance, before we leave this one to the next question, is it possible to say that some of the academic mythicists aren't on the same playing field as some of the guys who are, let's say, I'm trying to get him to budge really, really, really out yeah, there yeah. theories that don't even go into the vein of academia at all. Like for, for example, Dr. Richard Carrier, Dr. Robert McNair Price, would they be, you don't equate them to Holocaust deniers the same way you would someone else, right? Not generally. Cause I mean, those what, guys, yeah, they know a lot, but they know a lot, but they're completely wrong on this. Have you seen my debate with Robert? Yes. Price? Yes. So, yeah. I mean, I just think they're completely wrong and carrier, you know, carries a smart enough fellow. Um, but I think he does himself a disservice. He know he knows all. He's published, you know, he's got published, you know, a, an article or two in a peer-reviewed journal. He he brags about how many things he publishes in peer-reviewed journals. But, I mean, it's not like a big deal. This is what scholars do. But you know, there's nobody, there there is no professor of New Testament in the world that I know of in a in an accredited university. And there are thousands of people like this. Who's a mythicist? I don't I don't know. Uh, do you know of one? I don't know of one. I am not aware. And that's not an accident. And it's not, you know, they say, well, they're yeah. prejudiced against us. Well, they're prejudiced against you for the same reason that the biology department is prejudiced against somebody who doesn't believe in evolution, but believes in Adam and Eve. They, they think you don't have any evidence. And so, but, you know, they get offended when I say that. I know they get offended, but I'm just telling you the reality is this is, this is the problem. So why not, why not like use your intelligence to, it, I don't know what your goal. I don't know what the goal is. I don't know what the goal is, but um, right. because I never really kind of asked them the goal. But if the goal is to to help to help people realize that Christianity is not true, you're not going to get there by saying things that people are just going to think are silly. You know, I I have. It's to funny that last point of his, we'll by the way. The next question. I yeah. myself make that point. Uh, so, so this just illustrates like he's not even paying attention to anything I'm saying, right? So I myself wrote a whole article on uh, why you can't argue against Christianity with mythicism. Mythicism is not not as much of a smoking gun. It's not as certain a conclusion, right? So, uh, so I actually have said the thing that he just said there. And so the fact that he doesn't know that means that he's not even paying attention to anything that I do. And when he said earlier on, like, we're ignoring evidence. What evidence are we ignoring? Uh, point out what is not in on the historicity of Jesus. What evidence is I didn't put in there that I don't address? Uh, so, he, he, which he can't do because he he refuses to read the book. So this is why, like, his position is entirely irrational. Uh, that he refuses to even look at what the argument is. He just dismisses it and comes up with all these excuses about motives and whatever as a reason not to even look at the argument, much less address the argument. Uh, and, uh, so that's appalling to me. And, and, and that actually begs for an explanation is so what is his motive? Uh, why is he so resistant to even just looking at the case? He even won't even he, look at the case. He, like, I, I don't even understand. This uh, is which amazing. is really Dr. irrational Carrier, to do. If I may, and I want to say this, I said this publicly on my channel, right? I lean historicist right now. Not because I am exhaustively understanding or that I think mythicism is stupid. Absolutely not. And in fact, I, that's right. When yeah. I did this. I didn't like you don't see me going <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's the thing unlike, with uh yeah like like him denigrating and saying like there's nobody no there's actually almost a dozen examples that he incorrectly 
claims don't exist. Uh, you know, like and and like uh, and I list them. I pointed out this item twenty two and Airman recap article. Uh, no, these are sitting professors. Some cases emeritus professors, but that's the same. Uh, and uh, with full qualifications. Uh, they, and you know, so that like they at least will say what no, not what he's saying. They'll say, well, this is a plausible argument that's worth considering, even if they themselves, like you, like lean historicist, right? This right. And, so, like uh, you know, Philip Davies. Uh, Davies is an example uh, where he, he says, well, I'm a historicist, but I think there's something like this is a plausible argument. It deserves a seat at the table, same as anything else. Like if you're going to argue Jesus was a zealot, you know, it's a violent revolutionary. That's yeah. respectable, even though it's not plausible, but it is respectable. Like they're saying, there's this a is lot a, of we can have this debate. Right. And so like so Davies is an example of that. But then there are others who are, are admitted agnosticism about it. Hector Avalos, uh, who just passed away recently. Uh, he came out as saying, like, I, I'm on the fence, like, and he's a sitting biblical professor. Uh, I mean, if you were right, to so... pin me down, if you pinned me, like, if you if you really pinned me, I guess I would be ultimately agnostic because I can't put any weight of certainty on any of this. I'd say what sounds to me, what makes more sense in my head to me, right? So that's it. But real yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, that's worth pointing out. Uh, you and someone in the comments also uh, reminded me, like, the other thing is like he he keeps conflating me with like you tried to get him to disassociate uh, my work from internet randos right, uh, right which he wouldn't do uh, but he keeps assuming that like we're going around saying no it's absolutely certain Jesus didn't exist and this destroys Christianity I mean a I've repudiated that perspective I do not argue that at all in fact I tell people you shouldn't argue that uh, and and secondly my position is one in three like, as much as one in three chances a historical Jesus so I'm admitting like there's a huge amount of uncertainty here like I'm not going around saying I absolutely know for sure there right. was no Jesus all I say is the preponderance of evidence seems to lean the other way um, but I'm not going around confidently saying he definitely didn't exist uh, and so he doesn't even know what my position is uh, right. that, that that's 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 really shocking to me and uh, and it's a shame. Uh, well, that's why when he said what he said, yeah. that's why I was like, okay, let me at least try to get him to say they're not yeah. Holocaust deniers, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. I did yeah, try I and, and, uh, he didn't quite say you guys were, but it, you could tell he didn't want mm. nothing to do with it real quick. What yeah. is the definition of a myth? This is how do you define it, Derek? Well, from <laughs> there's different kinds, if you will, of mythesis, but Ultimately, someone who does not believe in the historicity of Jesus is how we commonly use it here. Yeah. Even though I've used there's I've seen people use the term, it's very rare that it's used for other historical people. Uh, like to say True. that this I'm a mythicist yeah. of this person in history or something, but but mainly it's like a coin right. term for Jesus and did this guy exist in history as an actual guy? Was there yeah. a colonel there? Um, not is this guy a uh you know, configuration of multiple other historical people that make him into this or something. Uh, was there a colonel? Was there a guy potentially at the start? And to me, yeah. uh, mythicist says even that isn't the case or most probably isn't the case. So right. it's someone yeah. who leans in that direction ultimately more so than sits on the fence or actually leans historicity. Yep. I'd say but that's that accurate. answers it. Yeah. I try to, you know, and one more, we got, uh, the, the King below. Thank you for the super chat. Bart really embarrassed himself in that clip. He continues to avoid actual arguments and instead resorts to pettiness and bizarre personal attacks. You yeah, know, I, I, I would I love to see you and him have a talk one day. I don't know how much money it would take. Well, he won't, but, uh, right? Yeah, he's he's adamantly against it uh, and gets angry at any suggestion that it happened. And, and he's refused already thousands of dollars to do this. I, I think there was a group that offered him five grand uh, to do have it to, to do the actually the Bar Robert Price debate that was gonna be me and him, but he refused to, to have me as the opponent in that debate. Wow, I always said I wondered what it would have been like if you did debate him on that. I always wondered, I, I still to well, this I day mean, kind of know because I, I wrote my post post action report blog, right? Like, which we did some uh on your show too to summarize some of that. Uh, but um, but the, the whole the whole idea of that, of like what it would look like. You can see like where I critique what I wouldn't have done. I even say like what I wouldn't have said if I were Price uh, and then what I would have said if I were in that position uh, and how I would have run the debate is pretty clear when you read my analysis of the Bart Ehrman, Robert Price debate. Interesting. Uh, we got a few more super chats. I did miss your, your. Uh, let me get this question here real quick uh, and then I'm going to get you guys here. I got to share the screen for this one. Um <laughs> Sorry, it's from the past. Indo actually did uh, a thing on mystery. Yeah, I remember religion. that. I thought I thought that got dropped there. Um, it did total accident. Bart. Yeah. Uh, let's see. 
So if Christianity was a mystery cult, why did Paul and the gospel writers try to spread the message and save everyone? Does this contradict Mark 11 through 12? No, right? Mark so 11? the whole point of mystery, all mystery religions are evangelist, right? The whole point of them was to spread uh, and grow and bring more people in for salvation. Um, the, the thing that makes them a mystery cult is not that they, the cults hide. Uh, the thing that makes them a mystery cult is that the, to get your salvation, there's some sort of mystery, a secret that you have to know, and you have to be an insider. You have to be like sworn to secrecy you know, and so on, and, and a, like an established insider to be given that, to be told what that is. And there might even be levels. Like, so the higher up, it's like the, the Masons, for example, the, the higher up you go, or Scientology is another example. The higher up you go, the more secrets you're told. Uh, and, and I actually, I show the evidence that Christianity was structured this way. There were higher levels of mysteries in Christianity. The higher up, higher ranking you were, the more you were told about these secrets, secrets. And these secrets you were sworn to keep, and they were never written down usually because, uh, uh th that would be, that would run the risk of them coming out and being revealed. So, um, so, and, and what was kept secret, what the secrets were probably changed over time because this is secret oral lore. That's the easiest shit to change, right? So, uh, so you, there's no stability for it, um, which is why the sex of Christianity exploded so quickly. It's like you could have all these sex, they, they can radically change the, the secret teachings in any way they wanted. There's no real way to like out them uh, unless you like, like a spy, you go infiltrate and whatever. Um, so, uh, so, and certainly for the first century, we don't know what the <laughs> mysteries were, but the mis but Paul refers to these mysteries a lot. So in, um, elements, gosh, I think it's 13 to 15, no, 13 to four, 13 and 14, uh, in chapter four of on the history of city of Jesus, I go into all the evidence for these, their mysteries that existed, uh, and what we do know about them, which is very little and in, in Christianity and the different, the fact that there were different levels of them. Uh, Paul refers to these mysteries and he hints at them. Sometimes he reveals them a little bit. We're not sure like how much he's giving away. Um, Cause he, he mentions, for example, marriage is a mystery about, there's something about Jesus, some teaching about Jesus as a husband that is a mystery in the church. He alludes to it, but he doesn't tell you what it is. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of this stuff. So the mysteries were just kept for insiders. So when Mark wrote, Mark is actually illustrating this point. Mark is illustrating he has Jesus going around evangelizing. He's trying to get people to be saved and whatever. So he's evangelizing, but he's doing it by telling stories, you know, parables uh, that are not true. Uh, and Mark, Mark has Jesus explain this. It's like, yeah, the parables I'm telling you, you're not supposed to take them literally true. They're, 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 they mean something else, but the secret meaning I'm only going to tell you the insiders, the apostles. And so this is a model for the, how the church ran. So that their public facing storyline would be, the gospel Jesus, but the mystery would be, you'd come in and, and you'd learn like, oh, well, actually this is a, a metaphor for cosmic events and stuff like that, right? So that, that's how that would actually operate. Uh, and so you had to understand the secret meaning and the literal meaning. If you took the literal meaning, Jesus says the people who take the literal meaning are damned. Like he says, those people will not be saved. So, <laughs> so, the, the whole, so it's like, so you're not supposed to take the literal meaning. You're, you're supposed to take the secret meaning, but the only way you only learn the secret meaning is by joining. Right, so that and this was actually this was a standard model. This is how all mystery religions worked. This isn't something new that Mark invented or, or Christians invented. Is there uh, a book and, you could so, recommend on reading uh, other than on the historicity that delves with mystery cults you think is important? Uh, oh, mystery cults in general, uh, or, what would be or the mystery religions, one? if you will, like the in this vein of the um, first century before we get to the super chat. Yeah, I'm, try I'm trying to think of what uh, I've got it jumbled in my head of what the latest one. Clauk has a decent book, I think. Um, you know, obviously in the historicity of Jesus, I have, I cite the, the leading literature. I'd have to go digging in there to find okay. out what it was. Oh, yeah. but, um, but but there's Clauk, which is K-L-A-U-C-K. He wrote a book on the mystery religions. I can't remember if that's the best one or the most recent one, but it is one of the top ones. Um, there's a few others uh, that I cite in, in OHJ. If I cite it in OHJ, uh, that means I'm recommending it, uh, unless I specifically okay. give a qualifier in there. Um, like there's an old one, it's like from the early 20th or late 19th century that I think is valuable, but I don't recommend it. And I say in the book, like it's obsolete in many ways, but it does have useful data in it. Uh, so I don't recommend that for people who want to get an intro. I would go to something modern, uh, something contemporary, which is, you know, Clauk's book, for example, but there are others. I, I'm not remembering them off the top of my head, but they are, they are the best ones are listed in uh, the, those, that chapter four of on the history of Jesus. Thank you, Carrier. Donnie Springer, thank you. Putting aside the text and lack of traditional historical evidence, how would you account for the rise of a religion based around a man named Jesus in this time frame with no buildup? 
I don't understand what no buildup means. Um, in the text, in light of traditional historical evidence, how would you account for the rise of a religion based around a man? Maybe he'll, maybe he'll add a comment, uh, fill us in. I, I'm not All sure. Right. I don't understand the question. So uh, are, are we asking, like, how could a historical Jesus have launched this religion? Or are we asking, how could the religion have launched without a historical Jesus? That, that That's what I'm not... I'm not that this at. religion riz, it rose around or based around a man named Jesus in this time frame with no buildup. So that's a good question. Like, I don't know. Well, I, so I, I, the best, like, so there's two ways to take that. If, if it's about mythicism, then my book, Jesus from outer space answers the question. Cause it talks about, there's a whole chapter in there about how the religion began and so far without a Jesus and why, why that happened. Uh, but if the question is how could a historical Jesus have done this? Um, that, uh, that I answer, um, uh, I have answered. So I, I have talked about like how that would occur uh, in various places. Um, I'm trying to think of what was the one that was that would be the most relevant uh, in answering this. Um, uh, oh, well, so on the history of Jesus, I have a section on revolution cults. There's a whole anthropology of revolution cults. Uh, and now those revolution cults were usually not led by someone. They're usually spontaneous arisal, arri arrivals of groups of people. So like the cargo cults, you had a bunch of different shamans hearing secret spirit messages and telegraph poles. Like they would put their ear up to a telegraph pole and spirits would talk to them. Uh, and there would be a bunch of them. And then a, a view sort of coalesced. And then eventually they attributed all those teachings to a guy who showed up on the island named John Frum or Tom Navy or those various different ones. Uh, one of them said Prince Philip, who's an actual historical person, but he never went <laughs> to the island and never started the religion. Uh, but these are made up people. So that, that, that that's actually a good model for mythicism is it starts like spontaneously and it is very sudden. Uh, it, it is a, cause it's a revolution cult. So it is like, a, what'd you say? Like a tipping point. It's like a tipping point religion. Like things come to a head and spill over. And so you have a sudden radical change and this new radical religion gets pushed. And if it's successful, it becomes a, a significant religion. If it gets crushed then, uh, or it becomes unpopular, then it doesn't. And so we have a lot of examples throughout history of these revolution cults. It's Christianity is just fits the model perfectly. It fits the anthropological model to a T. Uh, and I show that in On the Historicity of Jesus. And, and that's what it is. It's very much a response to the failure of Judaism in, in a way. So it's like a, a pe there were people who were dissatisfied with what Judaism was doing. It wasn't meeting their needs. And there are a variety of reasons why. A lot of that had to do with the Roman conquest, uh, had to do with the fact that the Jewish elite was collaborating with the Romans. People didn't like that. Uh, it had to do with the fact that a lot of Judaism was obsolete. Uh, it didn't really address contemporary problems and contemporary needs. Uh, and it, or at least it, people perceive, there are people who perceive that as being the case, right? So, uh, and those are the people who were looking for something new. Uh, and those, that's the, those are the people who spilled over into this new revolution. And so we would say this, like Peter and the original apostles would be the, the tipping point. Like they started this religion. It wasn't really, even if it's a historical Jesus, I don't think he meant there to be a religion uh, based around him. I think it's his apostles created that to market the ideas both that they had and that they got from Jesus. So even if it was a historical Jesus, I don't think it really was Jesus trying to start a religion. He was just a prophet trying to get people to uh, come to a particular sectarian point of view that right so that uh and 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 reject certain things and accept certain things and practice judaism the way that he thought would be the appropriate and proper way but his followers after his death it, they are the ones who constructed this whole religion complete with like resurrection theology and all the cosmic elements and the, the incarnationism and all of that stuff that comes right out of the gate and so they're, they're building all of that to sell their religion uh, and, and some of that is based on, would have been based on the teachings of Jesus. Some of that would have been their own stuff that they wanted to push. Uh, and there would be a political angle to it, which is, you know, uh, it's resistance to the Jewish elite, resistance to the Roman powers, uh, but through nonviolent means. So mm -hmm. it is, and, and I talk about the logic of this in the beginning of chapter five of On the History of the City of Jesus. When you understand the actual political context in which Christianity arose, it perfectly makes sense. And you should totally have expected it to have arisen uh, around that time. So if you want to understand that, that I do cover that in that book. It's all down in the description, baby topic discussed by really good friend, Gary. We're going to try and push through these super chats because we're coming out of, we're running out of time. I'm throwing you a donation after this, Dr. Carrier for your time too, by well, the thank way. You. I uh, appreciate we, that. We, yeah. We didn't expect this to go so long and I know a lot it's of fine. people. Yeah. Are, it's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. We have, we have a lot of interest and good questions too. I, well, I'm, it's I'm, mid vision like podcast. You know what I'm saying? Come on. 
Thank you so much, Gary, for the super chat. I really appreciate it. To be a historicist, does that mean you have to believe there is a historic person? Is that the same as a historical nature of Santa Claus and that there might have been a saint named Nicholas? What would you say to that, Dr. Carrier? Yeah, I, um, so I, I have a problem with the analogy in, in that there, there isn't really any adult who thinks there's a historical Santa Claus in the, the mythic sense, right? So, right. so uh, it's not like Jesus. It, it would be more like the angel Moroni, right? So the, the Mormons believe that the angel Moroni was an actual historical person. In fact, an actual man. Like Moroni was used to be a human and then he was ascended to angelhood or whatever. And then, uh, hit, you know, centuries later came down to like reveal everything to Joseph Smith. They think that's a re real historical person. And they think those are real historical events. Uh, and, but, but obviously not, there's no such angel. Moroni. Um, if you were to say you were a mythicist with regard to angel Moroni, that would be accurate. Uh, it's just that everybody who's not a Mormon is a mythicist with regard to angel Moroni. Um, so, uh, so it's usually not a significant statement, right? So people don't go around having to call themselves mythicists because Mormons are essentially a, a minor cult. They're or a minor sect. They're not, uh, they're not, uh, uh, they're not like white evangelicals in America. They don't dominate the narrative. And and most people, even Christian evangelicals, uh, rarely take Mormon theology seriously. So uh, it's not as an issue as G denying Jesus mythicism. And also there's no mainstream historian who thinks Moroni was an actual historical person. So so there's no need for mythicism as a concept there. So uh, it, it's not a, a challenge to any concept. Um, uh, but so yeah, to be a historicist, uh, I think a more interesting way to answer that question is how much of a Jesus do you need for you to be a historicist? Uh, and right. so, uh, and I do talk, I have a whole chapter, obviously chapter two and on the historicity of Jesus is specifically about answering this question. Uh, but uh, to really like summarize it, um, there are aspects of like the gospel of Mark, like the whole Christian fiction narrative is largely modeled on the, the death, uh, the, the, the narrative of this other Jesus uh, who died during the Jewish war, uh, and Jesus ben Ananias. Now, the religion was not founded based on this. Like, the, the gospel is taking a guy who lived long after the religion began, uh, and then he had this similar narrative, and Mark just emulates that narrative and packs in the material he wants, which is a lot of stuff about Christianity, a lot of stuff from the Bible that he wants to associate with his Jesus and so on. So he is borrowing, a, a there was a historical Jesus ben Ananias, probably, uh, or at least more likely than not, uh, and... Um, he is borrowing his story to tell the story of this other Jesus. But that doesn't make you a historicist to say that because the religion wasn't founded, wasn't begun by this Jesus Ben Ananias. He wasn't probably, might not even been alive then, or if he was, he wasn't a, a known figure. Uh, and, uh, and, and the religion isn't based on that. And only a, only a piece of the myth that Mark constructs is based on Jesus Ben Ananias. And, and then you could say there's other people that he's drawing ideas from, Elijah and Moses and so on, uh, that he's constructing his Jesus out of. So if you believed in a historical Elijah, um, I think that's 50-50 on there. If you believed in a historical Elijah, that would not make you a historicist in and of itself because you're saying, well, his, the mythical Jesus is based on Elijah, but they're not claiming that he was Elijah in the literal sense, uh, right? So they're not claiming that Jesus wandered the earth in whatever century Elijah wandered the earth, right? They're not saying Jesus is Elijah. <laughs> uh, so, so historicists, you do have to believe that there's at least some dude who got himself killed, crucified specifically, um, so he got himself executed. And when Paul and the early apostles are going around claiming, if you believe in this guy, you'll go to heaven or, or you'll be resurrected or whatever, they are referring to an actual man who was actually executed by the state, whether Roman or Jewish, doesn't matter. Um, that's what, that's the minimal you have, you have to at least believe it didn't even have to be named Jesus, by the way, Jesus could be a theological name. They assigned him after, but as long as there was an actual man who got taught some stuff got himself executed and that's the guy that these first apostles are going around saying is the messiah and that he resurrected and all of this stuff that's enough to be a historicist uh you, you don't even have to like it, say that he was named jesus in life he might have had some other name um because jesus means savior of god it's a very convenient name uh to assign it's it's, it sounds like Joshua. an assigned yes it sounds like an assigned name it was a common jewish name so there were people really called that um, but it's also a really weirdly convenient name to call him a, right. the, the savior of God to call him savior of God is, you know, suspect, but also we have the example in Josephus of several of Jesus Christ's. He never calls them Jesus. He never calls them Christ's. There are lots of Jesus's in, uh, Josephus's history, but I'm talking about the messianic figures. He never calls any of the messianic figures, Jesus specifically, um, or Joshua. 
is what we mean. Uh, but he talks about them, tells stories about them where they were representing themselves as the new Joshua. It's like, like this new Messiah was going to come along and he claimed that he was going to part the Jordan. Well, that's what Joshua did, the original Joshua, right? So this is a Joshua. He's claiming he's a new Joshua. And he's claiming that he's going to bring victory over the world and you know, bring in paradise or, or you know, bring victory over the Romans and uh, satisfy the prophecies of Judaism, which means he's claiming to be a Messiah. So he's claiming to be a Jesus Christ, which is mm -hmm. just not his name. It's just a it's, it's a role that the person is representing. And there are six of these uh, in Josephus, six guys who fit this model where they're representing themselves as Joshua and they're representing themselves as a Messiah. So they're both, they're all representing themselves as a Jesus Christ. So historicity wise, I, a plausible case could be made that our Jesus Christ, that's also a fake name, but there, but there was a real guy that that name is being assigned to, that a real guy who is purporting to be the new Joshua, just like Josephus records, uh, and purporting to be the Messiah, and that this new guy was just not anywhere near as popular as the six that Josephus decided to cover, right? So there, the, so you see this whole rash of these guys doing this. So like, the, so a historicity, a historical Jesus fits in here. Like it, it's definitely a plausible. Uh, it, it just means that he was one of the minor ones that just barely got, didn't even get on Josephus's radar. Uh, and that of all these attempts to create a new revolution in, in Judaism, only one of them randomly, one of them succeeded. And that just happened to be the one that we ended up being Christ, called, Christ, called Christianity. So I think there's entirely plausible theories to, to build about a historical Jesus that don't require a lot of details. You can reject right. a lot of details about the historical Jesus and still have a historical core there and call yourself a historicist. I do think uh, it's funny in Acts how the, there's the equivocation to these other guys. And they're like one of them saying, you know, like, the walls of Jericho, so to speak, the walls of the temple are going to fall or other examples that could be made, like go out here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to split the river just like Joshua did. So I'm yeah. wondering if this is kind of saying, now this is the real Joshua. It's kind of a right. theological. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, Thank no, you. Probably. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that would make sense. Let's put it that way. That would be a plausible theory. Either side theory. can use that data though. That's the, that's yeah, the problem that's right. that we have. So. <laughs> well, yes. and it is a problem. Yeah. It's epistemic, yeah. creates an epistemic ambiguity. And would, that's a common state to be in for ancient history where we're not often not certain about. And things. I want to say this and I want this to be like, please absorb this. This is why either side, it's important not to be dogmatic mm -hmm. and to approach this like in, enjoying this, especially if you're not someone who is an apologist, as we've been talking about with Daniel, where you have to have this be true or else if you're showing this, like mm -hmm. you're not open-minded and having this dialogue and he did not exist. He did not prove it. If he, you know, yeah, you're like showing right. you're a fundamentalist on the opposite side or vice versa. He had to have existed historically. You're a complete, it's like, let's, let's calm down. And say, <laughs> right, yeah. They, both are hyperbolic. Uh, I, I don't, I don't endorse either position. Uh, right. whereas I'm, I'm sympathetic to both of the lesser positions. You know, the reasonable historicity is a, re is a plausible position to take, uh, and as is reasonable mythicism. So, uh, I, I yeah, I reject these extreme, uh, absolutist thank points of view. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Crossover maniac. Thank you for the five follow-up question. Was the book of Mark originally intended to be just a story like Ben Hur? that was later declared to have actually taken place. And real quick before you answer yeah. that, uh, thank you, Dion. Thank you so much. Love having Dr. Carrier on. I appreciate that love. Thank you for the super awesome. chat. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I love the word intended, right? So that <laughs> now we're talking psychology. We don't really know what was in the mind of the author of Mark, right? So we, we what his intentions were, we don't know. Um, we can guess at, and we can guess at based on clues he's left and based on what was typical of the time. Uh, and, and the guesses are somewhat reliable, but not, I wouldn't assert as known fact. But uh, so like Mark four has been brought up in this, in this conversation where, where he has Jesus explain the doctrine of double truth, where there's a, like the parables you're not supposed to take literally, but I'm telling them uh, the outsiders are supposed to take them literally and that that's bad. And then the, but the insiders are supposed to get the real meaning. So Mark is cluing you in as that's what, he, that's probably how he intended his gospel. I, I think, I think he intended that as the, the key to the whole gospel. He's telling you that this is just an extended parable about Jesus. If you're taking it literally, you're an outsider, you're doomed. But if you, if you join us, we will tell you the secret meaning of all this stuff. I think that was the original intent of Mark. Uh, gradually over time, as gospels kept to be written, they really started pushing more the historical angle of it. So it, the gospels actually become more historicized over time. But by the time you get to Luke, 
Like he's actually trying to make it look like a history with details and things like that. And then when you, and he's even got like a preface, you know, a methodological preface. It's sort of, it's a bad one, but it's at least it's, he's attempting to sound like he's writing a history, which is not what Mark does at all. Uh, Matthew is trying to sound like a book of the Bible. He's trying to make his book sound like Deuteronomy, uh, right? Or Exodus or something like that. Uh, he's trying to make it look familiar, uh, like scripture. And then when you get to John, John's outright saying, no, this is literally historically true and you're blessed if you believe it and you're doomed if you don't. So he's completely flipped from what Mark is doing, right? Mark is doing the exact opposite of what John is doing. The authors of John, by the way, I, I don't think an actual John wrote it. Um, but yeah. uh, so, so you see this progression of this desire to make it more historicized and to push the historicity, whereas Mark isn't doing that. He's doing the opposite of that. That's what I think. So that's what I right. think isn't, so I don't think he intends insiders. I don't think he intends Christians to take the story literally, but he mm -hmm. might have intended outsiders to take it literally as, as a fake, right? As a, as a distraction uh, to mislead. Uh, and because we know this is what's going on in the other mystery religions, like the Osiris cult is a classic example. Tal uh, Plutarch wrote a book on this and he wrote it for a priestess in, in the cult. So like someone who knew what she was talking about. Uh, so he couldn't make stuff up. Uh, but so he points it out, like the, the outward stories about Osiris being on earth, being a Pharaoh and doing all these things are meant to deceive or trick outsiders. They're meant for outsiders. Um, but insiders know the truth that this is all a allegory for cosmic events. There was no actual historical Osiris. So uh, Plutarch's talking about this is just a normal way to run a mystery religion. So I, I suspect when you put these two pieces of evidence together, I suspect that's what Mark is doing. Uh, I can't prove it. Like I don't, I can't, we can't interview Mark and ask him. There's no secret letter where he confesses. So it's we don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, but but that, that's what I suspect is the case is going on with Mark. And now later gospels, they start changing up the way they want to do things. But right. Uh, one thing on Mark, I love sneaking my little questions into these super chats. But the last thing I wanted to ask is, do you think that Mark's making, and this is all like, there's many different ways to look at this, but do you think Mark's making the apostles look ri really ridiculous because of Paul, Paul's animosity between the original apostles and Mark's using Paul's ideas that he's like, they're dummies. They don't know what they're talking. They miss this. Uh, or do you think I there's see. other reasons? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, that's another one of those examples where I don't know the psychology of Mark. So I don't really know what he's doing. Why not? Um, and no, and, and the, the only reason I don't fully endorse what you're saying, because it's plausible what you're talking about, yeah, right? It's, yeah. it's a plausible position to take. Um, th there are two reasons why. One is Matthew doesn't get rid of it. Uh, so Matthew is the Petrine sect. So, so clearly the Petrine sect themselves saw a value in that version of the narrative. So they were doing something with it and they kept it. So they, 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 they saw something that, that was usable. Uh, so that leads me to suspect that there was some point to it. And then when we look at the, at the external evidence, so like Dennis McDonald has talked about this, where um, Mark is, and one of the things, Mark is doing two things. He's emulating Deuteronomy, just as Matthew is doing. Uh, more focused on the Exodus. He's emulating um, the Jews. If you notice the story of the Exodus, the bumbling Jews that don't trust Moses and constantly betray him and don't, you know, like walk away or like risk him or whatever, and then bad things happen to them and they just never come around and trust him. Uh, and all these amazing miracles happen and they still don't trust that God's going to help them. So they're exactly like the apostles in Mark. Like it's just type typecast, right? So, so it's clearly he's creating a model of Moses and the bumbling Jews following and not trusting him. So they're, they're represented as a, a model for how not to be just at in Exodus. The, the, the whole narrative is a model for don't act like these, these, you know, fickle, untrusting, uh, never learning anything Jews, like trust Moses, right? Like that's the whole story is like, the method, message of the story is you should have trusted Moses all the time. You've been all, you're much better off. Um, and so the, using the bumbling people uh, is, is a device for doing that. Um, and uh, another aspect of that is, uh, as Dennis McDonald also points out, is that this also emulates Odysseus and his crew. Uh, the, the whole myth of, of the Odyssey has the exact same model where Odysseus's crew are a bunch of bumbling idiots that Odysseus has to constantly save from, you know, so it's, it's a similar model. So it's clearly a motif that was very popular. Uh, it, it, it had a resonance, a cultural resonance at that time as a narrative to tell about heroes. And then the other side of it is that the whole point of Christianity was that this was a secret that no one understood. And only after the resurrection did people finally get it. Right. So like mm. that's that that you find in, you know, first Corinthians 15, like the apostles, Paul doesn't even mention the ministry of Jesus. Right. Uh, and which I think <laughs> is curious. But if you're a historicist, right. you still have to admit 
Paul thought that was, not only did Paul think this, but the creed that he's quoting, which is the original creed developed by the apostles, it's, it's, it's that he's quoting, it's not his creed. That creed has no ministry in it. Like, so they didn't give a shit about the ministry right. of Jesus. Uh, the only thing that mattered <laughs> right out of the gate is scripture predicted the resurrection, well, the death and resurrection. Scripture predicted the death and resurrection, and we saw Jesus resurrected. That's it. That's the whole creed. Uh, and so the whole idea is based on people were ignorant and didn't know. And you see this First Corinthians 2 as well. So like the idea of uh, God hid the secret to fool everyone uh, and, and particularly to fool Satan and his demons. Uh, and then only the particularly wise, the only the particularly chosen and wise learned the truth and realized the truth. That's all part of Christianity. So Mark is reifying this Pauline storyline. So like the apostles are bumbling idiots until, uh, you know, up, up until the resurrection. Now in Mark's case, he doesn't narrate the resurrection, but Mark's writing from the assumption that you, that your reader knows the story from then on, right? That he knows that, well, then the appearances happened, then the resurrection appearances happened, then the creed started and so on. So that the apostles turned around when they were convinced. And so Mark is creating this model of, of people who weren't convinced. Uh, and, and so it's not necessarily a critique of the apostles. The apostles might've actually originated this notion. Uh, that they were bumbling fools until the, they were enlightened, right? So, like, so this this concept may have already existed, and then Mark just turns it into a narrative, like builds it into a story. Uh, so, so I, so I, don't, so I, this all makes sense. So, the the idea that he's criticizing the apostles, which is a mainstream, like it's it's a theory out there, like it's taken seriously. It's not. I, I don't think it's proven. Um, I lean more towards the other, the theory that I just elaborately explained. You than made it I do sound really the, good too, by right. the way. Um, I want to say to 553 people watching right now, please hit that like button. Uh, this is, this yeah. has been a heck of a live. Seriously. You've got a lot of attention and go in the description, get his books. I'm telling you they're worth it. And he's on audible. So if you're driving, yeah. you got a trip coming up three hours, four hours, don't matter. A couple hours, get on audible, start chipping away and get this information. Even if you don't agree, I want to hear why. That's why I love this stuff. Like, it's so cool to learn. Converse contender, he's um, he's a good friend, actually. He's been on the live. He's a cool guy. He's a Christian. We disagree. But nonetheless, he says, will you debate future Christian historian <laughs> Camille? <laughs> Camille, uh, yeah, uh, anytime. Anytime uh, Camille wants to. Uh, we've had exchange of blog articles on, on the subject. Uh, so people can go to my blog and look at what I've written uh, in response to Camille Gregor's uh, treatment of this, Gregor takes at least a lot of this more seriously than uh, than like for example Bart Ehrman does. Like he's actually understands the math and and is trying to like uh, interpret how I'm using the math. I think he gets things wrong, uh, but but they're not because of incompetence or uh, um, uh, resistance to discussing it. Like he's uh, like Bart Ehrman for example. But uh, I, I think I think Gregor's got some interesting things to say. And then, uh, so I can explain why why he's getting things wrong about the way I argue in my book. But if you want to learn about that, you can find my article on the blog. Um, right. And then I think, you know, once I'm assuming he's read that, and so he knows where I'm coming from there, uh, so that we could actually have a productive debate that builds on that exchange. Um, definitely, I don't myself organize debates though. So yeah, someone else would me. have to organize I'll, that. I'd be <clears> the guy, but he said he wanted to first get a PhD. And yes, make that's right. I have heard. I have heard that. And, I respect and that's, that. that's totally legit. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I have no criticism for that approach. Yeah. And I mean, he's a smart, smart guy. Uh, so, you know, I really would love to do that in the future. Thank you for the super chat converse. Let's talk in the future, man. Uh, you can also email me. You can find me on Facebook. I'm all over the place. Alan, thank you for the super chat. If we accept Harold Lloyd was the prototype for Superman, is it reasonable to call Superman <laughs> a historical character? No, that, Superman... that, wouldn't, that wouldn't constitute historicity, right? That would be another Elijah comparison, right? So uh, even if Elijah existed, that wouldn't make mean Jesus existed. Um, just because Jesus was based on Elijah, for example. Um, so so no, that, that, that would, the answer would be no. <laughs> thank you for the super <laughs> chat. Question. No, I appreciate you sticking this extra time. Uh, everybody hit that like button. Share this out. Someone needs to see this. Look, this thumbnail that I made, I, I went on YouTube and I looked up uh, specific titles for Daniel is a forgery. And in fact, I saw mostly Christian videos. Right. I saw a pastor. I saw a two minute video of a pastor saying people are saying Daniel's a forgery and that it was written in 90 AD or sometime like that. And I'm like, Wait, that what? is like the worst. <laughs> Nobody serious is saying that. So he must have went in front of his audience and said, yeah. I'm going to preach this really wacky theory here to let everyone know, don't worry, Daniel's not a forgery right, and not right. address the serious situation of why it really is. 
And so um, I had to have you come on. This is going to be on YouTube. Anyone that thinks Daniel's not a forgery, I was going to ask you about Porphyry, but a uh, third century uh, historian who literally says he thinks it's a, it's a forgery. But uh, yeah, yeah. Would uh, you want I, I, so I didn't, I don't talk about this in my article. Um, the reason being is, and as I mentioned in the video I did, the post game analysis video I did with uh, Jonathan Sheffield and Boyce and so on. Um, the, uh, uh, so Porphyry did notice some of the things that we now notice about Daniel. Um, but Porphyry himself is not a modern historian. He didn't get everything right. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I mean, it's interesting that he noticed these things and published it. Uh, but I, I don't see him as someone to go to as, as the source for this idea. Uh, go, go to contemporary historians. There's, you know, the, you know, current commentaries, peer reviewed commentaries. That's where you go now for current scholarship on this. You don't need to rely on anything Porphyry said. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kerr. Oh, my good friend, Craig and Ford, we're doing a mythology show coming up about, Odin and Thor. So be on nice. the lookout for that. And we're not talking about like just the movies or something like he actually wants to tell you the history of these myths yeah, and, awesome. and how they actually in the proto-European world, like how this played a part. So go subscribe to his channel. He's going to be live on Myth Vision. You guys will see it. Thank you. Yeah, for I, I've been on his show too. Uh, he, he's really cool. Uh, so I recommend checking out his channel for sure. Seriously. If you want to go see that interview, it's on his channel right now. So Craig and Ford, thank you so much, man. I love you guys, and uh, thank you, Dr. Carrier. I'm going to be shooting you that uh, that uh, money here for spending this time with me. And everyone who doesn't know, I have to say this before we go. I know everything keeps added, but get on Myth Vision Patreon. Help Dr. Carrier, too. When I go and fly in, in uh, July... August? Oh gosh. Uh, no, no. It's September. Uh, um, I September. Think. September. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to so many places. Yeah, yeah. Um, September. Awesome. I'm going to be there and I'm interviewing you for two full days. I hope you'll let me harass you and get everything sure. I can. Yeah, We're going to promote you like crazy. All your content asking tons and tons of questions. I'm taking Patreon questions. Go join. All of that will be early on Patreon and slowly released yeah. on YouTube. So uh, I'm looking forward to that one, Dr. Carrier. Yeah, me too. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, never forget, if you have cognitive dissonance and you think that Daniel was written in the 6th century BC, then you might not remember that we are Myth Vision. Myth Vision.